Good Monday morning, everyone. How are you? I hope some of you got to watch some of the Crufts um, dog show over the weekend on YouTube. If you haven't, please go back and do so. I know one of our regular listeners, Scott Black, who will probably be on shortly, um, actually posted an adorable video. Um, it was a Border Collie that's actually won the freestyle three years in a row, and he and his owner trainer um, do a great little gig to Cinderella, so you'll have to catch that. But the reason I'm here today is to honor our canine veterans. Canine Veterans Day is actually tomorrow. It's March 13th, and it was founded by the U.S. Army Corps back in 1942, and we've been celebrating ever since. Maybe not to the degree we should, but we have been celebrating the day ever since. Uh, Joseph White, a retired military working dog trainer, originated the idea, and that's how it all got started. The first U.S. war dog, though, however, um, was Sergeant Stubby, and he was the most decorated war dog of World War I. Uh, if any of you out there know what breed he was, go ahead and mark it down. I'll get back to that in a moment. But he was found on the Yale campus, and then he was smuggled aboard the USS Minnesota, and off he went. Sergeant Stubby um, saved his fellow soldiers from gas attacks because he could hear the whine of incoming artillery long before his human counterparts could. He really became adept at warning them to take cover, and he actually single-handedly captured um, a German spy. There is a brick in the World War I memorial to honor our first war dog, and it reads, um, Sergeant Stubby, hero dog of World War I, a brave stray. Um, it was just, you know, an amazing, and he obviously wasn't a trained canine, but he really, really, really made a difference and, um, you know, saved a lot of lives and endeared himself to many humans. Um, Sergeant Stubby, by the way, was, of all things, a pit bull. So, you know, that breed gets just such a bum rap, and that's a topic for another day, but for every day, actually, to make sure that we don't judge animals by their breed. But that was World War I, and after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, men were drafted. Um, women rolled up their sleeves and began building war supplies, and dogs in this country were called to duty. This was possible because not only of Sergeant Stubby, but the United States took notice during World War I of um, the European use of canines as sentries and messenger carriers and other functions, and we initiated what was called the Dogs for Defense program. So we, um, the American Kennel Club and a handful of other trainers and breeders started training dogs for war efforts. And by 1942, the first um, dogs from the Dogs of Defense program actually were prepared for duty and landed in North Africa. They were very well trained, but it turned out they were quite gun shy. So that was something that was learned that had to be entered into the training program, but they ended up doing really well um, as the war um, progressed and continued, uh, Dogs for Defense actually was unable to keep up with the demand for the war dogs, and um, another branch took over of the government, or of in, I think it was called Remount Branch Service Installations or something like that, took over the training of the dogs. But over the years since then, military, police, rescue have developed, you know, a variety of training methods for canines, and the, ta the training is tailored to meet the needs. I'm kind of talking about canine veterans here, you know, military dogs, but realize this also translates to our police dogs that we see in our own local communities. Um, you may see these dogs working at airports and other big community public um, facilities. They're there risking their lives and saving ours, and it's just such an amazing thing what these dogs can do. Some of this is going to get me a little choked up, so I'm going to hang in here because when I was teaching high school animal care through the Burbank um, Unified, uh, Unified School District at the Burbank Animal Shelter, every semester I would show a movie called War Dogs, America's Forgotten Heroes. I've seen that movie more than a dozen times now, and every time I can get through it without a box of Kleenex. It's just amazing. It was about the Vietnam War and about the dogs and how they, they saved human lives. 
Uh, let me get to a few things first before I get emotional about the statistics about it. Um, military dogs, at least in that point in time, that pretty much carries through now, have to be at least nine months old, but no more than three years old. They have to be, you know, developed, but, you know, really strong. They have to be a sturdy working type dog um, that has power, endurance, energy, generally somewhere in the 60 to 90 pound range. Um, the men have to be able to pick them up and put them over their shoulder if they have to go, you know, across the ditch or up a mountainside or something along those sides. So they can't be too heavy, but um, they have to be a sturdy dog. They generally want them about 22 to 28 inches at the withers, at the shoulders, and um, just, you know, good bones, well-proportioned, deep chest, uh, strong legs, muscular feet with good cushioning. Um, their toes can't turn inward. So there's actually a lot of stipulations that the dogs have to go through. For the most part, they're male. They can be female if they've been spayed uh, 60 days prior to their deployment. For obvious reasons, we can't, you know, have a female in heat in, in serving in the military as far as dogs go because that would just attract and distract. Um, they have to be very alert, steady. They have to have vigor. They can't be timid. They can't be nervous because they are going to hear gunshots. Um, and it's amazing what they can do. They can sniff out an enemy at a thousand yards. Um, what these dogs actually did during Vietnam and still where, where these kind of tactics are um, used, they can detect the human scent on the um, landmines as well as they can actually, with their intense hearing, hear the wind blow across trip wires. So if you ever have the opportunity, and, and you can, I think you can see it online, but you can certainly order a video, I strongly encourage you to see War Dogs, America's Forgotten Heroes. It's just heart-wrenching, but you'll never look at, at, at military dogs or canines that do service for us, in, you know, again in the same way. Um, dogs are, in the military, are used as scout dogs. What they do is walk point, meaning they're the ones out front. They and their handlers are out front detecting these traps, like I said, in snipers. Um, obviously, this is the most dangerous job of all. Um, sentry dogs generally defend the perimeter around the camp, whereas tracker dogs can detect um, fleeing ambushers or even find their own injured soldiers. Water dogs um, can smell enemy divers underwater. In Vietnam, there would often be the enemy underwater using a, a reed um, just sticking up in the air to breathe out of. They would be completely um, submersed under the water. And the, the dogs could smell the breath of the um, enemy coming through the reed. So it would be amazing. People wouldn't have um, had any way of detecting these people, um, these snipers that were going to kill them. Another great use for the dogs in wartime is as companions and therapists. They were, you know, the best friends of their handlers and of the rest of the troops. Um, they provided comfort. They provided, you know, just therapy. You know what it's like when you have an animal by your side and when you're petting and you're, you're caressing. And um, it's just amazing what they can do. So I know other movies have come out since. There was one not too long ago called Max, which was actually about, I believe, a um, canine veteran that came back to the States even though his handler was killed. And I believe the dog was adopted by the brother and it's a very heartwarming story. I'm embarrassed that I actually haven't seen it, but sometimes animal stories are just so hard for me to watch. But like I said, this War Dogs, America's Forgotten Heroes, I've seen more than a dozen times, and I would watch it again as, as hard as it is because it just, it just means so much. Um, during Vietnam, uh, even today, I don't know how accurately uh, – records are kept, but more than 4,000 dogs and 10,000 handlers served. 500 dogs and 263 handlers died, but that left, you know, a whole lot. That left 3,500 dogs that served without perishing. So what happened to the rest? That's one of the biggest tragedies of that whole war, and some of this has improved, but not as much as we think. Um, those dogs were considered military property. And just like um, the helicopters were pushed off the um, aircraft carriers into the ocean and tanks were burned and left behind, basically the dogs were left behind or they were euthanized. 
Um, a lot of the dogs, um, one veterinarian stepped in in particular, probably many, and a lot of, uh, I'll say a number of the dogs were given to the South Vietnamese to use. But there was one dog in particular the South Vietnamese wouldn't take, and it was a black lab. Sorry. And you know that it's it's crazy how some of these things we don't learn from history. Um, it just keeps on perpetuating itself. And they considered the black lab unlucky or evil or something. They wouldn't accept the black lab. And if you watch this movie, the veterinarian in the movie was just heartbroken over it. And he actually found a place at the U.S. Embassy for the dog to go to. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, I guess Cyclone was burned shortly thereafter, and we don't know what happened to the dog. But um, it, it's just interesting that, you know, a lot of the things we talk about and that I'm always preaching about, about not judging an animal by its breed or its fur color or its age, perpetuate, and you know, for, for decades behind us and hopefully not for decades before us because I hope we're all bringing attention to these really important issues and going to prevent that from happening in the future. But um, dogs prevented tens of thousands of casualties during the Vietnam War and certainly all the wars that have followed since. Um, without these dogs, there would be a whole lot more than the 50,000 names that are on the Vietnam Memorial. So we have dogs to thank for so many things in our lives. And tomorrow being National Canine Veterans Day, I hope you'll just be thinking about that. I hope we can think about all these things every day, but I know our brains are all so cluttered and we're all trying to do good for the animals. So if at least, you know, if once in a while these things come to light, um, I think it's really, really amazing. It took, after the Vietnam War, it took until 2013 for a Vietnam Memorial to be built for the dogs, for the canine dogs. And it actually was in October of 2018 at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. So it's nice to know there is a tribute for these animals that did so much for us. Another story I want to tell you about is Rick Duran. He was only 18, fresh out of high school when he joined the um, Air Force, and um, he did, I guess he didn't know exactly what type of adventure he was going to go on, but in 1980, while he was stationed in Germany, he and his German Shepherd, he was a, a canine handler, were assigned to protect the 52 Americans that had been held hostage in Iran. And for the 444 days that they were held in that you know, country. Um, once they were, after that, they were released and they spent time in Germany before they could transition back to the U.S. And what Duran and Tork, that was the um, German Shepherd's name, what they were assigned to do was to ensure their safety while they were there and make sure they got on a plane safely back home. Um, Duran and Tork had to clear buses and ground transportation, the hospital where the um, hostages were living, the aircraft, and the big deal was the mail. When they were released, many Americans and American companies sent 52 of everything to these people. Um, it was things is you know from lobsters to blue jeans, I'm told, you know, um, and everything had to be cleared. So Tork, that German Shepherd, and his amazing sense of smell um, had to go through all of these items. Torque was a, a canine military dog for nine years. He never retired. Um, and Duran himself said he worked with a lot of dogs over his, you know, term in the uh, the Air Force, and that he just truly felt that his animals were more than partners. They were a part of him. They were an extension. He relied on Torque's nose 100% and Torque's nose 100% never let him down. So um, these dogs can do amazing, amazing things. It's so important that we, you know, keep the handlers and the dogs together when they come back to this country that we never, ever, ever again leave the dogs behind. They've done so much for us. And it's just, you know, if you can get involved in any of these programs that ensure that. There are also programs that are kind of the reverse, that there are dogs that are already here. They're called like canines for warriors and canines for veterans, things like that. 
that are um, human military veterans that suffer from PTSD and other, you know, issues, whether they be emotional or, or physical, are paired up with dogs that whose lives are saved by being pulled out of shelters, and they're trained to specifically help the humans. So that's wonderful as well. Um, you, you know, whatever, wherever your heartstrings pull and wherever you can help is great, but I'm just so... Um, adamant about wanting to make sure any dogs that we you know send over the to other countries to be military dogs that they do come back and that they get to live out their lives with their handlers or with a loving forever family uh, it, it may vary across the country i was lucky enough to really get to know a lot of the officers at the burbank police department in california really well and their canine dogs as well. And basically what would happen is when a dog got older and needed to retire, the officer that handled him was allowed to purchase him for $1 because they had to transfer the liability. And then that dog became the family pet. Um, the only time it, the officers, I think, pretty much didn't take that deal was if when they got their new canine dog that was their working dog, if for some reason the dogs weren't getting along. But in the only instance I knew that didn't happen, the dog still went to a family member and was still able to see his handler, you know, for the, for the rest of his life on this planet. So um, people do really bond with these dogs, just like we bond with our family pet. And I just want you to, um, tomorrow's the official Canine Veterans Day, but, you know, share a story online if you have one, if you know of a canine veteran. Um, you can certainly just take some time, Google, Bing, whatever browser you want to go on, and read a story or two just to be part of the day. Or just go online and thank a canine veteran. You know, thank the human handler that was with him, for gosh sakes, also as well. But the way you do that is hashtag National Canine Veterans Day and post, you know, just to thank you for all they've done for us so that we're living the life we are today. I know everything isn't perfect in everybody's life or in the country or in your city or whatever is going on, but so much could be so much worse, and we have so many of our military four-legged like included to thank for that. So thank you guys for listening in today about Canine Veterans Day. I hope you truly have an awesome possum week. And if you need something a little bit more uplifting afterwards, remember we talked last Thursday about the Crufts Dog Show and responsible breeders and dog shows in general. And just go on YouTube and find some of those videos about what's happened in the UK over the weekend with these dogs um, showing just their beautiful um, canine selves or actually doing some of the tricks in the freestyle. That's a whole lot of fun. So I will see you on Thursday, and we are going to talk everything Irish because St. Patrick's Day is coming up. Catch y'all then, and do something to make a difference in the life of an animal.